there are interesting tensions between doing academic theology and working in churches, as a number of people here do, and of course, as you do, Rowan. I wonder, do you think there are points of tension that might be helpful to a community like this one, as many of the people around the table here are starting out in, or potentially starting out in academic careers, some also involved in churches and thinking, well, how do we balance these different sorts of demands? The first thing that comes to mind, I think, is that pastoral ministry extends over time and, or should, so that you're learning constantly what can be said to this group at this moment. Um, you need to have your, your roots, and your background to give you the perspective, but you will have the freedom, in a sense, to adjust and to say, you know what I said last week? That's not the whole story. <laughs> That's rather harder in the academic world where you know, something is concretized is said, and that's now what you think. Mm. Whereas, to my mind, a good, a good preacher is somebody who is, who is taking the time to walk around the subject a bit, mm. and you develop a relationship with a community. You learn that in certain seasons there are some things that need saying, and certain other seasons other things that need saying. And I think one of the toughest things I found as Archbishop was what I sometimes described as having to be talking to everybody all the time. Mm -hmm. So, oh, the Archbishop says, the Archbishop thinks, and mm -hmm. they've got it in the newspapers, and, uh, <laughs> and you want to say, well, yes, but didn't you listen to the rest of what I said, or didn't you listen to what I said the week before? <laughs> and of course they didn't. Why should they? The journalists. <laughs> um, but that, that's what I, I sense as, as the main thing. That's why I, I really <clears throat> relish the opportunity, which I have a bit more now, of getting to know the same community over a period. And, mm -hmm. and so thinking, now this is a moment where it's a bit sort of wobbly, it's a bit insecure. They don't need me to be talking to them about um, bold ventures into the unknown. They want a little bit of centering. Or this is a moment where it feels a bit smug. Maybe I should kind of push a needle a bit here. And that, isn't that the kind of judgment you make all the time in pastoral ministry? Because you know a community and you, you're educated by them mm -hmm. as you go on. Yeah. And I, because we were thinking of Martin Luther King Jr. yesterday very much, I remember the story I heard about him arriving at some venue so exhausted and so <coughs> depressed that he couldn't bring himself to go to the church. And eventually people were swayed, you know, they've been waiting for an hour for you, go along, just, just put, put your nose in, show your face. And he went along and there was this sort of vibrant, excited, expectant community. And so he just walked up to the pulpit and delivered one of the great, great sermons. <laughs> the, the congregation did the work. Mm -hmm. That's also part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not quite how academic life works. Right. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not digging a great trench between the two, because in any teaching encounter, of course there's an element, isn't there, in which the students do your work for you, mm -hmm. and you are something that's drawn out of you that you didn't know, yeah. you learn in that. But I think it's, it's more marked in, mm -hmm. in theologizing in, in public yeah. as a pastor. a little bit more on how academic ministry and pastoral ministry mutually enrich and inform each other. <clears throat> I find it sometimes overwhelming uh, serving as a pastor on staff at a church while doing my doctoral work. And I say, why am I doing this? <laughs> Could you give some encouragement on why that matters and can be important? Good academic theology is, I think, always feeling for the connections. You're trying to draw out the connections. They may be historical, they may be conceptual, they may be imaginative, but you're feeling for the joins. Mm. And if you're somehow discovering more and more 
that connectedness, I think that sooner or later does impact on the integrity of your preaching. Mm -hmm. All of us know what it's like to listen to sermons that are just, and probably to preach sermons, that are just a collection of disconnected insights. Mm -hmm. You know, here's a thing, <laughs> and here's another thing, and, and the congregation's pardon. <laughs> But when you, you have a theologically informed, connected picture, when you're aware of what I like to call you know, the big picture here, that really helps. And I think that's what good academic theology ought to be about. And that's not saying you know, all good academic theology is dealing with vast systematic things, but you're looking for connections. And you know, just listening to the, the titles of the research some of you were mentioning earlier on, you're looking for connections, aren't you? So I think that's that's where you get the energy to grit your teeth and carry on. Um, somewhere I'm looking for, feeling for the joins, as I said. Uh, so how do you maintain or strike a balance between leading such a busy life as a public figure, a public intellectual, and while still maintaining you know, a sense of spiritual stillness uh, and quietude? How do you juggle that? Very unsuccessfully is the short answer. <laughs> Um, it, it simply matters to have, um, well, you know, a fairly strict daily practice. Make sure that when you get up, you go and pray and give, give most of the first hour of the day to, to listening and settling in and attending to God. And as an Anglican priest, of course, I, I'm bound to say morning and evening prayer every day, which means I have to recite the Psalms and read the lessons every day. And um, I have a, a regular list of people I will pray for every morning. So just try to make sure that that's where the day begins. And I know from bitter experience that if for whatever reason um, that's not how the day starts, then however much you might try to make up for it later on, it you know won't be quite the same. Um, and I because I've overslept or I've had to travel very early in the morning, I've missed my regular slot. Yeah, okay, you can try and do your meditation on the train or whatever, but I know that something is slightly out of kilter and I'll have to attend to that. But it's, yeah, it's boringly basic, I think, just make the resolution to, as I sometimes put it, to be there where God can get at you at the beginning of the day. Because I remember reading a piece that you wrote a few years ago on uh, Jesus' prayer. Mm, yes. How that's something you practice yes. on a daily routine. Is that something that you still yes. do? Yes. So. And have done for 40, 50 years. Mm. Because it's, it's a way of um, establishing a, a rhythm of breathing and attending and just repeating, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Mm. Um, and to say that a hundred times every morning sort of reminds you of the basics. <laughs> As prayers go, it does what it says on the tin. <laughs> I often like to ask people about their writing habits for those who are writers. I mean, you've talked a little bit about um, a kind of spiritual discipline and spiritual practice on a daily basis. Different people work in different ways. Some people are night owls. Some people are good in the morning. Some people need large blocks of time. Some people are good at sort of chipping away and coming back to things. Related to the previous question about busyness, I mean, lots of us in different ways are busy, um, doing lots of different things in our lives. Some Somehow we've got to find the time to sit down and do some writing, especially if we're writing a dissertation or a book or an article or whatever it might be. Um, how how do you go about these things? Do you, do you have a sp specific... Um, routine or do you just sort of um, pick it up as you go along or, or, or what? Well the nature of the work I do is such that there isn't much of a daily routine. I, it, it will change from day to day. Um, some days of the week I know will be mostly college business. It'll be a lot of committees. Some days I'll have three or four students to see in succession. Some days I'm traveling. So there, there isn't that obvious routine. So I've, I've had, I suppose, to, to make the most of the odd moment. Travelling, I find, is, is a good opportunity for trying to crystallise or consolidate ideas. Um, 
make the most of that time when you're out of your normal rut mm. and <clears throat> try and let things simmer a little bit. But ideally, I, I like to have more space than I need for writing. I'm one of those people who finds it very hard to settle down to writing and will, as soon as I've confronted the, the open page, think, I ought to go and make myself a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good idea, or <laughs> having a cup of tea. Or I ought to rearrange my pencils on the desk, you know. <laughs> writing, somebody said, involves a constant search for other things to do. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And the, the terror of the blank page is, is very strong. So I, I often feel I need enough space to get into that, to take myself out of it for five or 10 minutes, come back into it. It's very rarely I find that I'm able to write consistently for a couple of hours. I'll, I'll need a bit of hmm, cloud around it. But because, because I've had to work um, in the interstices of other things, write in the interstices of other things, I suppose I've got a bit better over the last 20 years in just grabbing whatever time is available. Mm. And that, <laughs> I like to think that's partly my excuse for being such a bad writer. I'm, I mean, <laughs> I know that I don't write easily and doesn't read easily. And I, you know, I repent in dust and ashes. But <laughs> it, that's partly because if you've got half an hour, you, you know, you, pour it out on paper and hope that it makes sense and then wait for the next half hour when you end up doing something quite disconnected from what you've just done and the poor reader says, now, how exactly did you get from there to there? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, again, I hope I'm getting better at, at rereading what I've written and actually giving a lecture um, that I've written is often an opportunity to say, oh, you know, I... I can see that there were two days between that paragraph and that one, <laughs> and I'd better do something about joining it up when I rewrite. You also write poetry. Do you feel like you occupy a different sort of mental space when you're doing your sort of your academic writing and then your um, your homiletics and then your poetry, or does it all is it does it all come from the same kind of place? Or ultimately, yes, I think, and in practice there are overlaps. But of course, the kind of writing you do as, as a poet is radically different. Um, a poem can take a very long time or a very short time. The analogy I use sometimes is that some poems just walk in and sit down and put up their feet and they, you know, they happen. And others will take you nine months or 18 months. You have a couple of images, a couple of lines, and it'll take forever to, to see where they're going. Um, I wrote years ago a sequence of sonnets and I wrote six fairly rapidly and I knew there was another one somewhere. Mm. And it was, a, I think it was over 10 years before I, mm. I found the remaining one. Mm. And I didn't quite know where it was going. And that's part of the, the fascination of, of writing poetry. You don't quite know where it's going to come out. Mm. And sometimes it doesn't, you sit with that. So that's different. You, you can't really, some, some people ask occasionally, do you set aside a certain amount of time every day or every week to write poetry? I say, well, you can't do that. I'm going to write a poem. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the terror of the empty page is even worse then. Mm. But something arrives, something strikes you, uh, an image, a phrase, and you think, yeah, that's going somewhere. Scribble it down on the back of a notebook. Um, hope that at some point you'll have a long enough train journey <laughs> to, to give you a bit of time to, to listen in, let it, let it declare itself. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, something of the muse, but there's sometimes moments where you have to work. Moments when you have to work and mm -hmm. where you have to tear things up too and say, actually, I was wrong, that's not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And that's always very painful. And sometimes, I suppose, you, you force it a bit, you push it and you end up with a poem and you think, yeah, okay, but that's not really, that's not really it. And you may or may not discard it, but it's not quite it yet. No. So I'm, I'm not surprised that poets like W.H. Auden would rewrite what they'd written earlier, um, thinking that's not where I am now. Mm -hmm. 
And it's very hard when you've written a poem some years before to say, yeah, that was all right then, it's not all right now. But don't fiddle with it, it's there. You know, it happened. But in the sense that the whole thing comes from some sort of perception of the world as it is, some sort of attunement to the world. Um, you know, I couldn't separate what goes into the poetry and what goes into the theology or the preaching. I mean, it's not as if they're different universes. Uh, going along sort of writing, reading habits, um, what are some classic mm. theological texts that you'd like to go back to for personal reasons, not just mm. um, purely academic? Yeah. I guess I've, I've gone back most over the years to three writers, perhaps. Mm. Um, Augustine, Bonhoeffer, um, and I would have said until fairly recently, Hans Urs von Balthasar. I, I find him harder now than I did 10, 20 years ago. Bonhoeffer has, has lasted pretty well for me, I'm bound to say. But when I read those authors, oh, and I suppose I put in Austin Farrer as well. Hmm. Interesting. Um, those are the ones I go back to for nourishment, not just for footnotes. I don't know how much Farrer gets read over here. Well, I, I've never read him in a book group here, but maybe we should. For those who don't know, he was an Anglican theologian, died in 1968. Um, relatively young, he was only in his mid-60s, and a philosopher of religion and a biblical scholar. And he was one of those maddening writers who never did proper footnotes. He just <laughs> wrote what he thought. And so if he wanted to know his influences or whatever, well, good luck. But he had a very distinctive philosophical approach, influenced by but not um, limited by a kind of Thomistic understanding. Um, he wasn't primarily a systematic theologian, more a philosophical theologian, yeah. but when he wrote about systematics, he wrote with such luminous intelligence and originality that I've often said four pages of Farrer on the Incarnation, say, is worth 400 from a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And he was also a great preacher, and his collected sermons are a tremendous resource. Along the lines of of reading material, you know, you've done a lot of work in literature. Mm. Um, and I was wondering, you know, of contemporary writers, mm. um, you know, who are the, the people that you would recommend to us for helping develop that, that kind of integrative imagination mm. that we need both in church and academy? Well, needless to say, I'm a great admirer of Marilyn Robinson, mm. whom I'm going to be speaking with tomorrow in Wheaton. And she's uh, really, really unusual case of somebody who manages literary, theological, psychological literacy all at, all at once. Um, for me, purely personally, Geoffrey Hill, English poet who died about two years ago, was somebody who represented that. He wrote a lot of literary criticism. He preached some sermons too. He was a layman, but preached occasionally and a very, very, very difficult, demanding poet. Really hard stuff, but he wrote quite a bit about grace and atonement and that sort of thing, and I really valued that. And in a slightly different vein, the poetry of W.H. Auden has always meant a lot to me in, in that respect. So there are a few people like that who have helped me see how the imaginative, creative world and the theological blend in together. On this side of the Atlantic, I'm a great admirer of Walker Percy as an essayist and a, a novelist. And um, there are some poets here that I find very interesting and encouraging, like um, Fanny Howe, um, Karen Forche. So those are some of the people I value.
would be virtues to cultivate in today's uh, academic environment? Well, you put your finger on something very neurologic there, I think, because it's it's an academic environment which is which is pushed to be talkative, competitive, <laughs> feverish, yep, um, impact driven, mm. result obsessed. So very often, I think, in the academic environment, you have, you have to try and go around the outside. How do I how do I spend time with with people that is not talkative and competitive? How do I perhaps find a colleague or two or three with whom I can just read something, which we, we're all exploring together? And reading groups in our graduate community in Cambridge seem to be flourishing more and more, as if people just want to get out, out from under the, the pressure just to keep producing. But actually, we ought to be sitting around a text together, just, you know, absorbing it. That's one, one thing, perhaps which makes a bit of a difference. I don't know. I mean, how, how do you do it? Well, it starts with <laughs> acknowledging that I often feel <laughs> praying for you and me patience. Both. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, I find it difficult because um, it, it seems as if the way to, to proceed is to be as non-Christian as uh, as you can be, uh, mm. uh, and I don't. Th I'm not saying that being competitive is, is not Christian, but it. it uh, what bothers me most in this respect is that you're not invited to study something thoroughly, which is completely against uh, what academia should be like, uh, because the big group is just publishing, publishing, publishing. So I don't. Um, mm. Perhaps I, that's what my thought. My thought is, might be you might be a better theologian outside the university than inside. That's what I'm sometimes wondering. Yes, I and mean, having an academic tenured post is not necessarily necessary salvation um, for a theologian. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sure about that. Um, <laughs> yes, but in terms of good theology, I, I do come back to the question of what is possible within the institution, and. As I say, I'm, I'm struck by the, the degree to which my graduate students want to talk to each other offline, as it were, we want to read together, and that encourages me a bit. Because whether or not they get academic jobs, I can sense that they're, they're learning, mm -hmm. which is a different yeah. thing from the academic yeah. process sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. commented toward the end of today's lecture about the significance of religious liberty as kind of the foundation, foundational to the logic of political freedom. And where religious liberty language um, often is not used very carefully, um, and it becomes kind of a, an elastic blanket uh, for limiting uh, state responses to racial uh, discrimination or um, discrimination against LGBTQ persons. I want to be someone who would defend the significance of religious liberty, but but I also am someone who's kind of embarrassed about the way that it actually works on yes. the ground. So can you help me? Yeah, well, it's, it's a good question. And I think Christians need to distinguish what is what is accepted as lawful as part of, you know, a proper expectation of being a citizen from their own ethical um, Oh, I don't know, convictions or positions. Take the LGBT plus question. Um, churches are in all sorts of different places on that question, and that you know that's just a fact of where we are in, in the church in the developed world. Um, but it seems to me that wherever you stand on that spectrum, it ought to be possible to say there is no case for depriving LGBT plus people of any kind of civic dignity or civic liberty that the, the expectation they have in society is, is and should be exactly that of any other citizen. Um, and if you say, as some denominations will, as in the UK, um, we reserve the right, right, not to perform 
for same-sex marriages, because that requires a change in our doctrinal position, which we have not yet agreed. That doesn't necessarily mean, so we, you know, we regard same-sex marriage as constitutionally unlawful, or we want to insist on a change of the law. You can accept the law, so that is a, you know, that's a privilege the law now gives. How, how we relate to it is another question. Sometimes Christian communities are very quick to shout persecution when, they, <clears throat> when it's a matter of you know, the social consensus going against it. That's a danger, I'd say, and I think that's part of what you're drawing attention to. I think the difficulty comes when um, churches and others are not clear what, where the boundary is between honoring an inherited tradition and actually undermining somebody's civic liberty. And it's not an easy distinction to be completely clear about. So I'm not saying it's easy, but I think certainly when I was um, Archbishop, one of the things I, I wanted most to insist on was you have to be clear about the, the social and legal question, the sheer human dignity involved. What you then say about the theological interpretation of same-sex relationships, you have to decide as a Christian and as a Christian community. The state can't do that for you. Um, so wherever you are on that spectrum, you ought to be able to stand in solidarity with people whose basic dignities are being undermined. But it is a tricky one. A healthy state or well-formed state is one that invites critique or is able to invite critique. Um, how would you ground that claim outside of theological claims? And what makes a healthy state? Like how can you say what a healthy state is apart from this sort of idea of justice that you've been talking about? I think ultimately, you're driven to theology. But I wouldn't say that, wouldn't I? I'm a theologian. Um, and I'm not expecting the government of this or any other country suddenly to say, oh, I see, <laughs> and come round. But it's part, part of that, that if you don't have a state that's capable of self-questioning or self-criticism, you will have stasis, you will have frozenness in patterns of power and authority. If you want to have systems of power and authority that are open to accountability, open to challenge, you have to allow conviction communities to flourish within that, just pragmatically. If you don't want to freeze, you have to have a trickle of warm water from somewhere. <laughs> and part of what faith communities do in a plural society is, is to provide that trickle of warm water that prevents things just seizing up politically. So that's a pragmatic argument. It's given not everybody accepts the theological premises. It's, it's where you start. And I don't know what it feels like over here, but um, it's, it's a discussion we frequently had in the UK. How far, if you're speaking in a public debate about some moral or constitutional issue, at what point does the theology come in? How restrained do you have to be? And some people would complain that you know, you're not being theological enough. You're not going straight in there with a theological claim. To which my response was always, well, there's not a great deal of point in going straight in with a theological claim if it means absolutely nothing to the people you're trying to persuade. So you have to find some ways of nudging that forward. But also to be prepared to say, if you want to know where that conviction and that perspective comes from, I'll tell you. But what, what does it feel like here? I mean, I'd be interested to hear from you as well on this. I'm not sure that the secular state has any reason to buy into Christian claims, hmm. um, apart from sort of theological conviction. Hmm. And I'm not sure the pragmatist way sort of works. At, at least when it comes to personal sort of morality I would, or ethics, I would want to ground it in some sort of uh, teleological concept, which maybe you could get some some sort of teleology from natural, like, apart from like revelation. Mm. Um, but I'm not sure. Mm. Worry about the pragmatism because that can lead you down a very sort of dark route as well. That also varies significantly from region to region. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it feels very different depending on where you are. Yes, and I think I think that's part of my worry about how explicit you want to be, how soon, that some people will use that explicitness for 
for their own political ends. And that's, I think that's about as dark as the pragmatic version. So that's why I say it's the point at which you want to introduce the theological. Mm. There's often not a consensus about what the theological presupposition should be. Like, you go to East Tennessee, you'll hear people using scripture one way, yeah. but then somebody might rebut with a disagreement on, on that view of it. So. Interesting if you look back at the, uh, the debates about slavery, where, of course, people argued theologically mm. on both sides. You yeah, could. so for, for example, in that case, pragmatically, what is the pragmatic end to which we're moving towards, right? You might say in the case of slavery, some people, even though they're making theological arguments, the pragmatic end was economic, mm -hmm. right? Maybe that's what they see as what works. Mm -hmm. It works for the economy. So even the question of what's pragmatically better has to be a theological question. Yeah, that's fair enough. I, I wouldn't want to say that the pragmatic argument will just settle it simply, whereas the theological argument is complicated. It's just what can be heard, what can move a conversation forward at particular points. And there's certainly a moment where you would want to say, and this is the rationale that dictates whatever teleology I, I have in view. Um, it's just, I think, an, an innate suspicion of, of a kind of over-glib appeal to theology early on, um, which, you know, we've, we've all been there culturally in the 20th century. <laughs> Interesting that, again, to go back to Germany in the 1930s, um, you could say, this is on, on your side, as it were, you could say that Karl Barth's most effective response to Hitler was almost to refuse to talk about Hitler okay. and just say, well, don't care what anybody else is saying. This, this is the theological perspective under which we must see all social questions. What's the problem? <laughs> and that has its own effectiveness. But of course, Barth ended up in exile. And, mm -hmm. Mm. Well, the pragmatism would not cut it in the 1930s, I grant you that. about your comments on justice and liturgical worship. Right. And you had mentioned one yeah. of the core pieces of a theological understanding of human rights being the, mm -hmm. our Eucharistic sharing in Christ's self-offering. Mm -hmm. And I found that very encouraging and very challenging at once because when you think of the Eucharist um, and corresponding it to your comments on recognition, mm -hmm. so often the table is one of the places where we don't recognize each other. Um, so often it's a place where those things break down. And so I'm wondering what your thoughts are in terms of how we can deepen our discussions about how to recognize each other across the table. Because if the core place where we're unable to do that isn't strong, then that has implications for human rights as well. That's a very interesting question. And I think Part of the answer, as Erin was suggesting this morning, is imaginative. Do we induct people into Eucharistic worship in a way that enables them to see themselves as, before anything else, guests? Do we, do we reintroduce a kind of um, claim and deserving element, or do we just see it in terms of being guests? And that's quite complicated in terms of church law and admission to communion of the baptized and all the rest. I know this is an issue in uh, <coughs> some parts of the Episcopal Church here, and I, I think try to back off in panic <laughs> the question, but it, it's, it's a difficulty. I don't minimize it. Is this fundamentally about an agency of welcome to which I am responding? Because if it is, then everyone standing alongside me is on exactly the same footing here. And I am not more deserving of the gift than any any other, and that's liberating. That's that's the paradox of grace in a sense that to recognise I, I deserve nothing, is is a source not of humiliation but of extraordinary confidence and and non-anxiety. I don't 
I don't deserve anything. I don't have to deserve anything. I'm, I'm simply welcome. So that, that's part of it. Um, and then, of course, the question is, what do we do as a Eucharistic community, which makes that concrete on Sunday afternoon and Monday? And how far the, the guest vision is actually fleshed out. I'm fascinated by the work done not so very far away from here, but in um, St. Gregory of Nyssa in Berkeley and Sarah Miles' stuff about bread for, for the word. You know, that, that kind of thing does strike me as profoundly central to creating a Eucharistic ethic. Um, and even the, the simple question of what sort of relationship do you expect to see developing um, over coffee after the, after the liturgy? It's, you know, as crude and basic as that. Is that a, an occasion where people retreat into their, into their tribes? Yes, frankly, a lot of the time. <laughs> what, what do we do about that? But how, how, how do you cope with it as a, you know, as a pastor? Well, your comment about, about coffee hour as a reflection of the Eucharist mm -hmm. is, is something I think about often. Um, some of the work I'm doing is, is in performance theory and, and musicology, mm -hmm. and this idea that we make meaning by breaking it apart and reconstituting it physically, as musicians do when they memorize music. And I think that in the coffee hour, people do that too. They break apart what they've experienced Eucharistically or homiletically, and they're reconstituting it for good or for ill, um, whether there's homiletical or Eucharistic misfires or... or they're reinventing uh, your sermon, you mean? Right, right. It's like, I said that? No. <laughs> um, but, but this idea that people are making sense of what's happened in the liturgy in the coffee hour, in who they talk to, in who they overlook, in who they realize they've overlooked and returned to. Um, and seeing a community change in that because of the Eucharist and because we talk about the Eucharist, mm. seeing a community become more mindful of who we recognize and who we don't. Yes. Um, that's, I think, the power of coffee hour. And I think it's sometimes where we can see the success or failure of our formation. Does that ring bells for people? I find it very... It was along a similar line, but maybe even going back a step, it's the problem of a homogenous church in worship where we don't even have the opportunity of meeting yeah. or welcoming us and other the other in Eucharist or whatever our piety happens to be. Uh, can, yes. How would you address that problem? It's important, isn't it, because so often in certain kinds of society, churches are a self-selecting leisure activity. Let's, let's be blunt. And that means you, you won't meet people outside your comfort zone. That's where I think there has to be some kind of um, <clears throat> intentional engagement with the actual social setting somewhere along the line. To whom do you open your doors and when? And who's there to open those doors and, and welcome? So even if you have churches that are essentially um, opting in voluntarist groups, how do you how do you get traction with the actual community? It's, it's one of the differences we often notice, I suppose, and Oliver, I'm sure you've got thoughts about this, between the UK and, and here. Although a lot of churches in Britain are like churches in the US, there's still some sense in the parish church that that's, you know, that's just the one that people go to. Mm -hmm. And there was a visit I made to an East London parish some years ago, where I remember looking around the congregation thinking, thinking I don't know where else in this, in this vicinity you would find old and young and black and white and rich and poor and all the rest together in this way. And that, I felt that it looks like a church that's working for that reason. But given that that's not the pattern in most churches in this country, I think, the question is, so what is next door? And what is across the street? And how do I, how do I engage with that? But I'd be interested to hear how people actually cope with that or think about it here. I think, I mean, it's, I see that same sort of um, vision of a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-aged society um, in a lot of sort of consumerist locations. You know, if I go to Starbucks, like there's a Starbucks across the street 
from the church, from one of the bigger churches um, in my neighborhood. Um, and Starbucks is a lot more diverse than the church. You didn't and say. don't really have problems <laughs> yeah. with, like, associating mm -hmm. um, in that sort of setting, mm. or even college campuses. Mm. Um, I don't, I don't think that necessarily is the point. I'm just saying um, the communities might uh, put that into practice. It just doesn't happen in the church for some reason. Maybe that's because the the kind of Starbucks culture has certain similarities to a more geophysically based pattern of church that you get in the old world. Uh, where you've got um, a parish system, yeah. because in a parish system you've just got a geographical area that's um, that's you know cordoned off as a parish, and all those people within that area, wherever they come from, are those people that you are pastoring to, reaching out to, and so on. I suppose similarly um, with Starbucks culture, you've got a Starbucks on the corner. People from that general vicinity will congregate in Starbucks, whereas often it seems in the US church culture, people drive in and, uh, as you were saying, are self-selecting. Um, and so those sorts of constraints don't uh, apply in the same way. Tamisha. As it relates to uh, churches that are self-selected, I think that there's also the layer of um, churches of groups who are immigrant communities or communities of color that purposely self-select mm -hmm. um, because it is a safe space for them to not be able to have to translate or do all these other things. And so it becomes a community of safety for them in, in the place of worship. Um, so I would probably say let's think about those communities and the safe spaces um, that exist there when we're thinking about the complexities of homogeneous churches. Good. Kind of following up on Tamisha's comment, I serve as a pastor on staff at a, a multi-ethnic church, and and on paper we're very diverse, and you know we, you know, we share leadership and everything. But I think one of the issues we constantly come back to is the issue of power, mm -hmm. uh, and in invisible and invisible ways, uh, invisible and invisible ways. What ways is power dictating our liturgy, uh, our life as a community? And so I'd be interested to to hear comments you might have on the way that power can be interrogated. In communities to better reflect uh, kind of the dignity of the bodies that make it up. Mm. Big question, but it's it's crucial because I think one of the things we we ought to be probably paying more attention to in the formation of pastors overall is what I might call literacy about power. Mm. What is it about the pastoral office that gives you power <coughs> that you may not understand or fully register? And in in the UK, we've been in recent months going through this uh, very, very traumatic public business of inquiries about child sex abuse in the church. I've, I've had to give a witness statement and be interrogated on this. And the theme that comes back again and again there is we have not been literate about power in the church setting. We have not understood, you know, even people who have, of course, abhorred child abuse and disciplined it, they still haven't quite understood why the problem arises and what the culture is that somehow colludes with it. So that's that's one thing. We just have to, in training, get, get a bit more focused on that. So next question is, of course, how does liturgy itself destabilize that? And I guess there are, there are a number of ways. But as soon as you say, OK, that's the way we destabilize it, <laughs> then, you know, power has, is back. And you say, yep, this is the conventional sort of power, this is the unconventional sort of power. Any questions? On we go. <laughs> and how you, how you manage a liturgical framework in which there's just enough room for people to disrupt it in certain ways. Looking back at a couple of experiences where I've been in an act of worship that's been disrupted, I felt A, alarmed and anxious about it, and B, sort of grateful about it as well, because something has emerged which, which is not scripted. When I was Archbishop of Wales, there was a mentally rather troubled woman who followed me around and appeared at every service I took, which was quite alarming. And especially as on one occasion she turned up wearing a T-shirt saying, the Archbishop is Satan's puppet. Um, <laughs> you know, concentrate, concentrates the mind a bit. But I, I, used, to, I used to warn parishes and say, look, if Anita turns up 
she needs to be there. Mm-hmm. And somehow she she has to be part of of what's going on. On one occasion, I remember she, she sat on the step beside me as I delivered my sermon because she wanted she wanted to sit there. And I don't know what the congregation made of it, but <laughs> that's an extreme example. But somehow to have some sense of how you cope with genuinely disruptive elements, not panicking about it, not saying, oh, you know, everything is now shaking on its foundations because something unscripted has happened. So I don't know how much more I'd want to say. What, what do you think about that? I think one of the challenges in multi-ethnic contexts is, again, coming back to power, is that who's in control to manage what is appropriate disruption. So, for example, yes. I've been in, in uh, <laughs> I've been in worship here at Chapel at Fuller, right? And so there's somebody singing a, a gospel song, and everything in me wants to get up and start running around <laughs> because I just feel the spirit moving me in a particular way. And yet there's this other part of me that's like, they gonna think I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and so, right, and there's a certain that's a certain culture that says what's appropriately disruptive and what's not appropriately disruptive, and trying to trying to manage that. Yeah, you know, that reminds me of one Corinthians. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's all there, isn't it, in a sense? And part of what I think Paul is, is saying in 1 Corinthians is each one of you needs a certain sense of that division. Um, yeah, I feel, I feel moved, but actually, is this going to do anything for the community? It's not that someone up there, Paul doesn't imagine there's somebody up there saying, you shut up. He's saying almost, you need to learn at what point you say to yourself, you shut up. <laughs> Yeah, I think the interesting thing is that people, typically the people who are told to shut up, so to speak, are those who are the the minority, right? And so when you're conditioned in a culture that's always telling you to shut up and you're in worship, you ain't trying to hear that no more. And so I think think, think that's that's a different kind of environment. And typically the worship context is catering to the dominant group. So in what sense should the dominant group allow themselves to be disrupted so that those who want to express themselves in a way that's life-giving, fruitful, uh, can do so. Yes, yes. A, no, no, that puts it very well, I think. What are some of the practices that you think might be conducive to our recognition of each other or conducive to the recognition of human rights, maybe more broadly, in your own um, spiritual journey? The proper use of silence is part of that. Mm-hmm. You know, the, a listening and attention to God and one another. This is, this is where the Society of Friends, the Quakers, I think, are doing something really, really important. Mm-hmm. The, the liturgical event is simply being there with each other and attending. <clears throat> just attending and if we can help some of our help ourselves and our fellow Christians to understand some of what that silence and attentiveness means that's that's part of it it means that I do not have to be dominating this event I do not have to be in charge of this event um, it's quite difficult for a pastor um, and indeed a bishop <laughs> Well, the whole point is, in a sense, people think you're meant to be in charge. <laughs> and to say, well, it's... Yeah, the pastoral role is often giving permission for some of that space. Not policing it, exactly, but saying, oh, it's okay, don't panic. We, we have room for this, we have time for this. So that's, that's one thing I'd want to underline, I guess. And back to... Um, the question of welcome and being a guest. I sometimes like to say, when I'm preaching at Holy Communion, just take a moment after you've received Holy Communion to look at the person next to you or just think about the person next to you mm. and think that is someone whose company God longs for. Mm. And hang on to that for a little bit as you, as you pray. Mm-hmm. That is somebody whose company God longs for. Even if I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for being here. And thank you, Dr. Williams, for sharing such a wide range of different things with us this afternoon. I think it's been a very profitable time. Please join me in thanking Dr. Williams. Thank you.